So are we all in the room? <laughs> that was just a little music to start with. We're all in the zone. <laughs> right. Here we are back on Zoom. Well, welcome everybody. I had been expecting to be welcoming you all in person, or at least a good group of you all in person in our sanctuary. Um, but as we have all learned these past couple of years, uh, sometimes we have to pivot, <laughs> uh, you know, based on things that happen. So we had, you know, a couple panelists uh, that were feeling sick, and uh, we had our the 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 manager that that normally does our video production. Uh, his girlfriend was just uh, tested positive for COVID on Monday. Um, so we just realized that it was probably a good idea to keep us safe <laughs> and to do this over Zoom. And luckily we are all pretty versed in this Zoom room thing by now. Um, so, you know, I have to say I am sad that I'm not getting to meet you all, especially some new folks since I'm new to town uh, in person, um, but just welcoming you all here. So 
Um, yeah, I am Reverend Masando Hiraoka. I am the associate minister here at New Thought Center for Spiritual Living. I'm coming at you live from the Parsonage, <laughs> which is right on campus here. So I, you know, I, I live and work. Uh, my commute is pretty good um, every day. So yeah, just really excited to be a new member of this interfaith leadership team for Lake Oswego Sustainability Network. You were one of the first orgs that I heard of and looked up when I got into town and have just been uh, welcomed with open arms and, you know, of course, been put to work as well um, with this team. But uh, we're just so excited uh, that you all are here. And if you all are watching the recording, thank you for tuning in. Uh, and just really excited to talk about this intersection between faith and uh, sustainability and how our faith both um, inspires us, uh, but also challenges us and also uplifts us to engage in this continual work. Um, so really excited uh, to hear from all of the panelists. Uh, and I know my own faith life will be deepened uh, by our time together. So, you know, we're gonna be opening up for some Q and A afterwards as well. So please uh, engage with us. You know, uh, we love to hear your voices, recognizing there's a lot of wisdom present here in this room. So uh, thank you all for being here. And I will turn it back over to Dorothy and Cheryl. Okay. All right. Um, thank you so much, Reverend Masando. Um, I'm Dorothy Atwood and I'm with the Lake Oswego Network. I know many, many of you, I see many familiar faces and names. Um, I am too excited, very excited about this event and um, sad that we were so, we, we had such anticipation of being all together and in person and we all met at the sanctuary a few days ago and it was beautiful and we, oh, but anyway, so we'll just hold that thought and save that for another day. But I, I just, for those of you who may not be as familiar with LOSN, we've been around since 2013 and our, you know, I have right here my mission vision to help to remind me of the, the details that our vision for a community is that Lake Oswego is a community in which the needs of the present that would be us, are met without compromising the ability of future generations, those that are, come after us, to meet their own needs. Um, and that we have can flourish in a vibrant community. So um, we're very excited about that for our organization. We, our network provides grassroots leadership, inspiration resources, and opportunities for um, collaboration and innovative solutions to help Lake Oswego become more sustainable. So that's that's really what we're all about, you know. What one of our founding board members, Lisa Dotto, I think she says it the best is we like to help others achieve their sustainability dreams and and be supportive of that. So that's um, what we try to do. And you know, the interfaith group. Gosh, I was just trying to think how long we've been around, but it's been quite a while now. And uh, that's just one of the many things that we do. One of our big pushes this year is Electrify Lake Oswego. And if you're interested in that, you can go to the library tomorrow at seven and learn more about, about that or go to our website and see, get some details. But we also are involved in our schools, in our city. We've been following our wastewater treatment plant <laughs> process um, and our new rec center to see if we can, and um, what we can do about that. Um, make it more sustainable. We, we look at natural resources. We've had tree summits with the Oswego Lake Watershed Council for several years running. Um, many of you may have participated in our, our, um, our electric vehicle fair, which this year in October is going to also include a vendor fair. So, you know, we, we have, we, we do a whole lot and there's lots of ways to, to in, get involved and engage. But this is one of my favorites is to, to look at the spiritual side of sustainability. And um, so we're very excited to, to have this panel. So the way this evening is gonna go is we've got our panelists and we have our, um, we have, some questions we want them to each 
have a chance to answer. We gave them these questions ahead of time so they, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be a surprise. And then, then we wanna open it up to a more informal conversation with all of you. So there, there'll be a chance for, for um, question and answers. Um, but first I'm gonna turn this over to Cheryl to introduce each of our panelists. Um, so let's go ahead and Cheryl, you can introduce. Everybody. Okay, so I'm just going to go, as I say each name, there are five of uh, five panelists. Did, did Is Christy here? Oh, oh, there's Christy. Okay, so you might just like, when I say, when I say your name, <clears throat> just like wave your hand or something. So, exactly. yeah. so okay, so first, um, Reverend Masando Hiaoka, um, very new here, just very, moved here from Denver, Colorado, just in July, so really new. Um, he's been a minister now for six years, an associate minister at New Thought Center for Spiritual Living for just under a year. Some favorite pastimes, um, he says he's a little bit of a sports nut, playing sports, watching them, being around them. I know most folks here will probably hate me for it because of Russell Wilson. I don't even know who that is, but, um, but I'm a huge Broncos fan. I know, I, don't, I know Denver Broncos. And for the first time in six years, excited for your team again, <laughs> a bit of a competitive person and sports fulfill that part of his personality. Um, part of your regular sustainability practices, try to focus on reduce and reuse of the three R's more than the recycle. Um, he says it's, it's easy to just think about recycling as a best practice, but those first two are really what make a bigger impact. And, um, yeah, anything that anything else he said, just grateful to be part of this group, which is wonderful. We're grateful to have you here too. So Reverend Jenny Ott, pastor at Lake Us, pastor at Lake Oswego United Church of Christ, just down the street from um, New Thought Center. She served for the past 12 years. Time flies. Originally from the East Coast, Jenny was drawn to Lake Oswego UCC in large part because of its deep commitments to both environmental and social justice. Having previously served churches in Connecticut and Minnesota, she finds that the people at Lake Oswego UCC have taught her how to live more sustainably. When she's not at church, which is most of the time, <laughs> Jenny enjoys hiking, cooking, journaling, biking, and spending time with her wife, the Reverend Hilary Martin Hyman, and their two young boys, and they are very active young boys, I can tell you. Her, her most current um, sustainability practice is preparing the garden beds for her homegrown veggies and slowly and steadily removing the black plastic that is buried in her front yard and backyards. She's grateful to be joining the conversation tonight and we're grateful to have her. Stephen Phelps, where's Stephen? Wave your hand, okay. Um, received dual bachelor's degrees in physics and philosophy from Stanford University and a PhD in physics from Princeton University specializing in cosmology. He worked for 13 years at the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel, in its research department, where he coordinated the indexing and collation of the Baha'i sacred writings and their translation from Persian and Arabic into English. It just makes my mind freeze. Uh, during that period, he concurrently held a research position in the physics department at the Technion University in Haifa and published original research on the masses of nearby galaxies. He currently resides in Portland, Oregon. Actually, he lives right here in Lake Oswego with his wife, Catherine, and three daughters. And they are also very active and beautiful young girls. And I know, keep him very busy. And, and Catherine also hosts um, the story time for Respond to Racism uh, on the first Monday of each month. So that's his, his wife, Catherine, does that. Okay, so um, for Father Tobin, um, let's see. Um, Okay, yeah, Reverend Warren Bradley Tobin uh, was born in Missouri, baptized at First Christian Church, Disciples of Christ in Jefferson City in 1972, graduated from the University of Missouri at Columbia with a BSBA in Finance Commercial Bank Management. That same year, he was confirmed as a Roman Catholic at Sacred Heart Parish in Columbia, Missouri, choosing the confirmation uh, name Paul. Did I say Missouri right? Because I know some people say Missouri, <laughs> but I always say Missouri. Okay, all right. So, um, 
He entered formation um, for priestly studies at Conception Seminary College in Missouri and received the Certificate of Pre-Theological Studies. He pursued graduate studies in religion and theology at the Catholic University at Louvain in Belgium and was, uh, that's probably Louvain in Belgium, and was awarded the MA in Religious Studies, the MA in Theology, and Sacre uh, Theologi Theologiae Licentiatus. That I probably did, I probably messed that up. He returned to the United States and became Director of Campus Ministry and Associate Professor of Theology at St. Gregory's University in Shawnee, Oklahoma. After prayerful discernment, he made the difficult decision to leave the Roman Catholic Church and began a career in interior design in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, then relocating to Portland, Oregon in 2005. He returned to academia as Associate Professor of Religion at Clackamas Community College in 2006. In 2007, he was received into the Episcopal Church at Trinity Episcopal Cathedral, which raised him up for holy orders in 2013. After completing Anglican studies at General Theological Seminary in New York City, he was ordained to the um, diaconate, did I say that right, in, um, in priesthood in 2014. Brad served as assistant priest at St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Eugene, Oregon, 2014 to 17, and as rector at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He is currently rector of Christ Church, Lake Oswego, Oregon. Brad's family is small. His brother, Kurt, resides in the family home in Holt Summit, Missouri. His parents, Paul and Mary, are deceased. Paul is a liturgist and organist. That's impressive that you're an organist. He continues to seek the balance between working out and eating fine food. Brad's sustainability practices include avoiding processed foods, being as paperless as possible, use of renewable energy, and dining by candlelight. That's great. Brad enjoys camping, cooking, and reading. He has a passion for all things King's College, Cambridge, uh, a love of single malt scotch whiskey, and an obsession with fireplaces, especially antique English cast iron inserts and grates. And finally, uh, about Christy. Um, uh, so Christy says, she and her husband moved to Lake Oswego in 1999. After a stint in Texas for her husband to complete a medical residency, she, uh, they immediately returned to the area to raise their family. They currently live in West Lynn and attend church meetings in both, both West Lynn and Lake Oswego as part of their church responsibilities. She officially joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with her baptism in 1984 and has served as a full-time missionary and in various leadership and instructional positions in the church. Currently, she serves as Assistant Communication Director for the church over the cities of Lake Oswego, West Lynn, and Wilsonville. She appreciates this opportunity to talk about religion and sustainability. Her interest in the combination of faith and stewardship of the earth began while earning a degree in botany from Brigham Young University, the flagship university of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She enjoys the Pacific Northwest outdoors immensely, skiing, hiking, climbing, paddling, rowing, running, and simply marveling at the abundance and the beauty that surrounds all of us. Her family strives to use the, the earth wisely and not to excess, being mindful about how our food choices affect the environment, recycling, reusing through uh, Deseret in Industries and many other secondhand stores in LO and the area, and in educating their congregation and family about opportunities to contribute to efforts that benefit the planet and its people. She's also looking forward to this discussion. And that's all the words I have for the night. <laughs> wow, thank you. Now I'm a little intimidated. I know. <laughs> Well, it made me feel good when I was at, before we let you all in, we were talking and, and I asked everybody how I should address them. And they all want me to address them by their first names. In fact, Father Tobin, Brad said, he'll respond to, hey, you or dude. So <laughs> this makes me all very happy. So anyway, well, let's get, let's get into this. I'm, I'm really excited. Um, so I'd like to start with, with Jenny. Jenny, you, you go first. And the question that we're going to start with is, 
you know, sort of what we describe this whole thing as is what are the core theological tenets for caring for the planet in your faith tradition? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dorothy. And uh, it's good to see all of you here. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, yeah, well, thank you for starting with me, too. We have a number of folks from similar traditions. So you've given me the easy the easy start, I think. Um, and I would say, you know, two two places where I really ground my own understanding of sustainability. One is in the um, in the Judeo Christian creation stories that we have in uh, Genesis, of course, that the world God created the world as good. God created the world out of love and God created the world for flourishing. And that in those creation stories, we see this beautiful ecosystem that is uh, working together and of which humanity is part of, that we are part of that web of uh, creation and that we are called to essentially be co-creators with God, stewards. Um, we are to tend and uh, be faithful in, in helping to uh, preserve and work for the flourishing of all of creation. So uh, I think that's that's a main one. And then the other, of course, is in uh, the life and ministry of Jesus. And um, we think about how he was asked, you know, what's the greatest commandment? And it's to love God, uh, love Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if I think about uh, all of creation, having some of God or being um, made in uh, out of God's love, that then when we think about loving our neighbor, that is, that's creation too. That's the earth. That's the flora, the fauna. And, um, and that we really, again, are called to love our neighbor as ourself. And I, and I think too, I mean, Jesus always was, um, had a heart for the marginalized. And I would say right now, our earth is marginalized and uh, our planet is marginalized. And so really working to uh, love neighbor as self and uh, live out that love of God. Wow, you really did. You took my stay under two minutes to heart, but <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, Stephen, I'm going to move on to you. Okay, what would you, what can you add about the Baha'i faith? Sure. Um, well, first of all, echoing all the points Jenny made, she kind of stole my main talking points. Um, <laughs> I would say three things, um, three uh, fundamental points I would, uh, I would, bring out from the Baha'i teachings. The first is an answer to what kind of a world do we live in? Um, since the scientific revolution, there's this, been, this idea that the world is fundamentally made of particles. It's separate things, you know, billiard balls bouncing around in space. Um, it would be like the best approximation. Um, but there's a deeper, more ancient idea, which is also a more modern idea, really, which is that everything is really entangled with everything else, not just in a spiritual sense, but mathematically, according to quantum mechanics, um, infinitely dense causal web is really more what uh, what defines this world. It's really a, it's a single thing, um, and that's the that's the first thing. Is this sort of the deep interconnectedness of things is is really the deeper reality and not the separateness which we see uh, on the surface. The second point is that is that the, these interconnections are not just some static configuration, but it's in motion. There's it's it's dynamic. It's evolving, it's progressive, both materially and spiritually. The universe is like an organism, it's almost like a, almost like a living organism. Uh, it's, not just, um, it's not just there statically, but it's growing and evolving. What direction is it evolving in? It's, it's, direct, it's evolving in the direction of consciousness, specifically self-consciousness. The universe is in a constant state of waking up, waking up to its own reality, uh, waking up really to the fact of its own divine reality because the universe coming to the knowledge of its own reality is um, is God coming to God's own knowledge of his own reality because ultimately the universe is an expression of God's yearning to be loved. Uh, so the processes of creation, whether it be in the physical uh, world, the, the cosmological uh, evolution of planets and galaxies and so forth, whether it's the biological evolution on this planet which which brought us into being or whether it's the social evolution of human beings, and our increasing um, uh, complexity as as uh, as society uh, coming together in increasingly vast and subtle configurations. All of this is part of an unfolding cosmology of love, really, uh, because it's through greater and, uh, and greater configurations uh, coming together in greater and greater degrees of unity that the that higher uh, levels of this divine love are unlocked. 
And that brings us to the third point, which is the point we're at today in, in the world, uh, our, our historic turning point that the planet is at. It's a special point in history. The, the, the world is passing through a very turbulent period of adolescence and it's on the threshold of its own maturity. The, it is reaching the physical boundaries of the planet. Really in our lifetimes, we are seeing for the first time the boundaries of the planet being reached in terms of we cannot continue the unlimited extraction of resources. We're starting to see the effect of this on the environment. We're starting to see uh, the, the um, environment of our planet change uh, in very measurable ways. So physically, we've reached this point where we cannot continue as we were before. Spiritually, we're also reaching this turning point where we need to advance to the next level of our collective consciousness in order to survive. We need to have a dawning awareness of the organic oneness uh, of the human race. And it's only wow. through, that, through that awareness of the oneness of the human race that we can really come to an understanding and start caring about other parts of the world that we otherwise might not necessarily naturally care about. It's only through awareness of the oneness of the human family that motivates us to really care about the environment. And when we look at what, where, where climate change is gonna be most severely felt, it's not gonna be Oregon. It's gonna be parts of the world uh, filled with people that we're not normally thinking of as our neighbors. And we have so to- So Stephen, to I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have yes. you hold that thought right there. Um, those are my three points. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And I want to invite everybody, if you have further questions from this physicist, gone. Thank you so much. Please, well, every or if for anybody, please put them in the chat. We'll get we'll address those in the in the QA if you want to get them them down. And um, thank you, Stephen. And that now I'd like to hear from Christy. Christy, what can tell us about um, your perspective, please? Thank you. So I'm here representing the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and uh, we share a common foundation of faith with our Judeo-Christian brothers and sisters in that we reverence the Old Testament and the New Testament as the Word of God, and uh, we declare Jesus Christ as our only source of salvation. But there are notable differences between <clears throat> our faith and others, and uh, I think some of those differences have uh, uh, an impact upon um, this discussion about sustainability. So for instance, you may have seen the tall white spires of the temple off of Cruiseway and I-5. Uh, maybe you've even walked on the beautiful grounds. And if you haven't, I invite you to, uh, to do that and enjoy that. Um, so the temple serves a different function for us than our chapels or churches where we attend on Sundays. Only members of the church and members of the church in good standing are, are permitted to participate in ordinances and ceremonies in the temple. Um, but you may be interested to know that uh, this kind of apex of our religious experience, um, a major part of that temple ceremony is a depiction of God's creation of the earth and his interactions with Adam and Eve, whom he instructs to take good care of it. So another difference between the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints uh, that adds a religious imperative to sustainability is our expanded scriptural canon. In addition to the Bible, we accept three other books of scripture um, and all three refer to our stewardship of this earth and thus establish a unique environmental imperative. For instance, if you have ever felt, and I am confident that all of you have, uh, the majesty of God while contemplating the wonders of the natural world, then you may relate to Alma, an ancient prophet in the Book of Mormon, who said, all things denote there is a God, yea, even the earth and all things that are upon the face of it, yea, and its motion, yea, and also all the planets which move in their regular form do witness that there is a supreme creator. So God's creation is a testimony of him and an expression of his love for his children. Uh, another of our, our books of scripture that are unique to the Latter-day Saint faith is an expanded version of the exchange between God and Moses. 
And in that we read that when God created um, the plants, he says to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight of man, it became a living soul. And in regard to animal life, out of the ground, I, the Lord God, formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. And excuse me, something popped up here. And they were also living souls. So our worldview is that nature is teeming with living souls, and that places a deep significance on our actions and our choices in regards to them. Finally. You're muted, Christy. Christy, Christy, I, oh, there you go. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I was, um, keep going, please. Okay. All right. Almost done. Um, Good, so in 1834, Joseph Smith recorded these words from God. It is expedient that I, the Lord, should make every man accountable as a steward over earthly blessings, which I have made and prepared for my creatures. I, the Lord, stretched out the heavens and built the earth, my very handiwork, and all things therein are mine. So members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believe we are stewards, not owners, of the earth's bounty, and that we will be held accountable to God for our actions in regards to it. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. That was, that was, really, that was really wonderful. So uh, now I'm going to move on to Brad from the Episcopal tradition. I love being in fourth place because it's a summary of everything that we've heard. So Episcopalians don't have a defined doctrinal system, but I think what comes out of this for me and for our Christian tradition is what we've heard before, so that in the Hebrew Bible, we have the creation stories, we have two of them, and both of those stories are creation centric. They're not human centric. Humans are created in the second creation story in chapter two of Genesis as the first being, Adam is, and all of creation follows from that. But I think what's interesting in that story is that the story is rooted in creating an equitable partner for God. And so all of the animals, all of creation fall into that, into that reality. And the first story, pardon me, <clears throat> which is the beginning of Genesis, the seven day story is, is a creation myth that every religious tradition you can find in so many ancient traditions before Israel, but what marked it especially for Israel, it was the creation of the Sabbath day, that there is a day of rest. There is a day in which all things come together. And in that story, the Sabbath doesn't end. So the Sabbath ideal is what we are living in now. And it is, it is a reality that's, that is about right relationship. It's about every part of creation being part of a reality and part of a whole, um, very much as Stephen said. So you have that in the Hebrew Bible tradition, which becomes the whole basis for, for Judaism. How is this right relationship moved out? Everything being in proper proportion to God, to humanity, to the world, to creation, and this, this wheel, as you will, and this seven-spoke wheel runs through time. In the New Testament tradition, I think that the real heart of it is, especially what we're facing today, it is Jesus preaching of what the kingdom of God is. And the reality that the kingdom of God is opposed by the kingdom of Caesar or the kingdom of Rome or now the kingdom of the world, which is the domination system, which exploits for profit, which exploit, exploits um, the environment, it creates an economy that it's not just, and it creates a situation in which human beings are not sharing equity with one another. And that's exactly what we're seeing in so many, in so many realities outside of our world, 
but especially in a predominant culture that we live in, the domination system of America right now is exponentially worse than the domination system of Rome that the New Testament records. The, the separation between wealth categories, the amount of wealth that's held by such a small amount of the population, and it's, it's that reality that is so countercultural to, I think, what every religious tradition, but especially a Christian tradition holds um, in terms of what sustainability is about. One of the things that I would, I would say that's so surprising to me, and it's really disheartening, is that after two years of a pandemic or three or however many long it's been now, <laughs> that we are still wanting to just return back where we were. I mean, this flies in the face for me of a Christian experience of suffering, of, of redemption, of laying down life, that there is always another way to go. And the Christian tradition is born out of an extreme experience of grief and loss, and, and it, yet it was born into a place in which we could move beyond what we knew before. And yet, after a pandemic that we, that I think, you know, was a very, how can I say this carefully, a very grace-filled experience, not what we expected, but immediately we want to go back where we were two years ago. And that is not what sustainability is about. I think it's always about going beyond to curb the way in which that we, we experience life, we use resources, and we exploit one another more than anything. I think that is one of the things that is so, is so detrimental. Um, one of the things that- Brad, can I stop you there? Yes, yes you may. Thank you. Uh, one of the challenges I can tell already is each of these people could fill an hour and a half with wonderful, thoughtful words. And we haven't even heard from Reverend Masando yet on this first question. But so anyway, I'm gonna move on to him. And so we can hopefully have a, an expanded conversation um, as we mo move on. So um, Masando, please. Thank you. Yeah, I feel so blessed by everything that has already been shared. I think, you know, New Thought Center for Spiritual Living may be sort of the more uh, outside of the, the normal Judeo-Christian theological foundation, although we have our roots in progressive Christianity, so we have a lot of that that's part of the, the lifeblood of who we are. Um, but really at the core of our theology really is one that is panentheistic, right? We have this belief that that all people, all beings, all life itself, including the earth itself, are expressions of the divine, are expressions of the divine. And that, just that core fundamental tenet, I think, is one that creates this spiritual imperative uh, to think about the world not as separate from our own life, but to think about the earth itself as something that's deeply a part of who we are. And that as we connect with, you know, manifestations of the divine, we are connecting with the divine itself. So as we care for the earth, as we seek to understand the ways in which the world is evolving and unfolding, but also seek to discover the ways in which like the divine is still at play, the ways in which God is still at work right here in the midst of what really feels like a global climate crisis. Um, I think that is, that is at the root and heart of, of our theology because we also have this tenet that we are in continual co-creation with the divine, right? We, there's, there's something about our tradition that kind of calls us into this sense of like, no matter what has come before, <laughs> no matter what we've experienced individually or collectively, we have the capacity when we are deeply connected with the divine within, to be able to change from that place that is in constant co-creation, that is in that lives from a place of harmony, that takes into consideration um, all of the different life that exists 
knowing that is fundamentally a part of, of the divine expression of, of life itself. And so we also have this tenet that says, hey, like we can, when there are enough people, when there, when there, when there are enough minds, when there are enough hearts, uh, when there are enough points of consciousness uh, working towards the same thing, miracles can happen, change can happen, um, even change that feels like way bigger than we could possibly do on our own. And so that's an imperative of us, like in order to practice our tradition, uh, there's this imperative to also like fully engage uh, with our own transformation and, and the ways in which that transformation is being called forth uh, on our planet. So the ways that that can get, you know, interpreted varies throughout our tradition. Some folks say, just focus on yourself and your own community. And other folks are like, no, we're like all about social justice and being out in the world. And so we have that diversity within our own, you know, tradition and congregations. We have, you know, over 400 across the North America um, itself. Um, but our church really is focused on social justice and climate justice itself is, is probably one of the more active parts of our congregation. And so we're really rooted in this idea that like, because of the oneness, because the divine exists within everyone and everything, we're also deeply interconnected, just like Stephen Phelps said. So, you know, caring about the climate is really just a care for that divine within. And as we do so, you know, our spiritual life grows. And so if we really want to care for our spiritual life, we got to care for others and for the planet itself. So yes, I can keep talking and going, but we should go to the next person. Thanks well, for everybody's thank, response. This was in love. Thank you. This was, I could tell we're going to need to do this again. I, I'm, I'm loving this. Um, so our next question, and I'm, I'm going to start with you, Christy, and this is about faith. So um, faith, how does your faith support you in navigating our current extreme climate challenges, sustainability challenge, sort of sub question to be, how does your faith help you have and continue to have faith? And what is the resilience that your faith provides to you? And what can faith do for you? Thank you Christy. so much. Um, because this is a, a very personal question, how does, how does my faith support me personally is, is the way that it was framed. Um, I wanted to share a, a little bit of, about my favorite church song growing up. Um, and it's, it's a song that every child in our, in our faith probably knows. It's called, I am a child of God. And it says, I am a child of God. And he has sent me here, has given me a home with parents kind and dear, lead me, guide me, walk beside me, help me find the way teach me all that I must do to live with him someday. And I think the thing that religion does is provide context for us. So I grew up knowing that I had value because I am God's. I am his child and he loves me. And that means no one can take that away from me. And by extension, that means that you are God's, you are God's child. And before we are citizens of countries or members of political parties or a color or an orientation, we are siblings. And that is a construct that shapes how I behave in a myriad of situations. But it also means that God will be with us because he is a parent who loves us. Uh, I'm a Latter-day Saint. We believe in a very involved God. If he's willing to make a personal appearance to a boy in 1820, which is the Genesis story of our faith, if he's willing to actually communicate to prophets and apostles on the earth today to direct his church, then he is willing to be involved enough to help me solve my problems, and certainly to help his children as they band together 
to solve the problems that we are facing. With God, nothing is impossible. So I have a lot of optimism that as we work together towards solutions, that God is willing to be with us and help us find solutions. The other, the other thing that my faith does, um, it's kind of like the counterpoint to the lifting and the, the, the nourishing of I am God's is I will die and I will stand before my maker and give an accounting for what I've done and the decisions I've made and how I've treated my brothers and sisters. And that means that we need to be very, very careful with the actions that we take in regards to um, the souls of this earth, the soul of the earth, and, um, and that we need to take this very seriously. So though, that is how my faith has, um, gives me hope and resilience, um, but is also kind of a sobering reminder of our responsibilities and our stewardship. Wow, that was great. Count, point and counterpoint. That was, that was really nice. So Brad, let's hear from you about faith, how your faith supports you. So what's been important for me is to, is to realize and to study and to learn that, that faith or believe in is not believing in something that's um, an academic proposition or a set of, of truths, incertitudes or propositions propositional statements, it's rooted in the notion that we, we believe in ourselves and the reality of our creation, as we've heard so many of us say. Um, one, of, one of the central understandings that I have of, of how we are created and how it is that the world is and God is, is not, is in a, not a pantheism, but in a panentheism, that God is in all things, all things are God, but there is a reality beyond that. So that, so that I would rather speak about the sacred than God as, as personified. And this has to do with, for me, with the creation stories that we, that all of creation is an emanation of God in that beautiful story of Genesis God speaks and it comes into being. That in Hebrew, the word dabar for word is very dynamic. It, it becomes what it is when it's spoken. And we, we are the very words of God. And for Christian tradition, Jesus is the word. Um, so that faith for me is about not believing in, but beloving. That old English word or the middle English word that really has to do with, with belief. We, we beloved something. It's a love relationship and all of, all of creation, all of reality is a love relationship that, that is unfolding and fighting as it were and loving as it were and coming into a fullness of one. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jenny, let's hear from you. Sure, thank you. And I also, I just resonate so much with what my colleagues are sharing. And I think um, we, use, we use some different language, but we're talking about the same things, I think. And I, and I just really resonate with, you just shared Brad and Sando and Steven. I think the, that idea of the divine, being in everything and and that for me i think for my own faith that idea that um at the core god is about love and god is about connection and and that 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 presence of god or that sacred is in every it's in everything and so the more that i align with that with that sacred or that god that is in me um the more i am in connection with each of you with the with the trees the earth because that 
because I'm awake and alive um, to that to that presence. And I think about you know in our in the tradi tradi uh, Christian tradition, of course, resurrection is a, is a core theme. But it, what it is is that that is a God is a, God is a God of life, and that life um, that life is always on the way, and love love wins, and life wins, and that God is a God oriented toward life and toward flourishing, and that that's what God is always working for and yearning for. And so that when I can, and I think that's also what we see in the natural world, right? The cycle of life, that life comes out of death. And so for me, I think just remembering that, that that's, it's not just me out there working, trying to work for good or work for resurrection or work for new life or work for healing, but that is what God's energy, the spirit energy, divine energy um, is also doing. So I think it puts me into like, a river that's already in the flow and I'm just getting in the flow and and it just helps it move move faster maybe. So I would say that is kind of for my own my own interior belief. I think the other way that faith really helps me is in a faith community and having a community of practice and having people um, to keep us accountable, as you said, um, Christy, to have people to share ideas with, to work together on the days when it's overwhelming. Uh, to remember it's not just me but we're side by side working doing this together and so i feel like my faith just really gives me that that hope and that meaning and that purpose and that when it's overwhelming there's still my little part that i can do and um and that others are are with me in that and god is with me in that thank you thank you this is great Lissando, what would you like to add to the conversation about faith? Yeah, I love how Christy started with just personalizing it. Um, so, you know, I, I'd love to do the same thing. I think one of the things that really initially drew me to this particular faith path was one that it was really accepting of all faiths. I grew up in a interfaith household. My dad grew up Japanese Buddhist and my mom grew up Episcopalian. And so New Thought was a place where they both could come and those religious backgrounds could still coexist and thrive. And we didn't have to you know, do away with them that all of that is foundational uh, for, for you know, this faith as well. So um, but what really drew me to it was not only that, but this sense that there, there is always more possibility and that our faith, um, often is measured by how much we can really believe in ourselves and in each other and the ability for more good, more love, uh, more joy to exist uh, right here in the world. And that as we experience those things, those are the experience of the divine itself and is, is what God wants us. That, that is the experience of that. I think more than anything, when it comes to sustainability and addressing our climate crisis, my faith just gives me hope. It almost like demands hope out of me. <laughs> like if I really wanna walk this path, um, whether it's in my personal life and my personal challenges or our collective life and our collective challenges, I think my faith just demands me that like, that I know that regardless of what the current situation may look like there is always possibility for more love more life for change and transformation to happen and that um and i think that more than anything else is what kind of upholds me and uplifts me when i'm watching too much news like for too long um <laughs> and i feel the weight of that in my body you know um then, you know, asks and invites me to go spend some time in nature because that's often how I let go of my stress. And then I get an experience of the divine. And in one minute, I was super stressed and hopeless. And in the next, I wake up again to like the true nature of life itself. And for whatever reason, that helps me keep hope uh, and possibility for the future, not just for me, so, uh, but for, you know, future generations. Um, some of my congregants don't know this yet, but um, my wife and I are, are 16 
weeks pregnant. And so I am thinking more about the future now than ever. Um, and so, you know, I think that hope is really resonant <laughs> in my life right now that, um, yo, I want to, I want to, I want to leave a better world and I want my kids to be prepared to face the challenges uh, with that same kind of hope that my faith demands of me. Wow. Well, I'm glad you, you, you um, shared that because what you said made me want to share it to, with everybody too. So thank you, Masano, and congratulations to you. That's, that's very exciting news. All right. Last but not least, Stephen, what can tell us about what you're, what you'd like to add to the conversation? Thank you. Well, congratulations, Masanda. Um, my faith, I feel, is so is so strengthened by panel discussions like this, uh, because it just deepens my my own intuition, which is which is a, a core tenet of of my faith, that uh, that there's an underlying oneness behind all the religions of the world, uh, which is far more important than the doctrinal divisions um, that that all too often get in the way. Um, doctrinal divisions, which have have their reasons, have their um, have their validity um, within the context of time and place. But when we don't understand the the relative truth of of the of the great religious systems of the world, the the great spiritual paths of the world, when we don't understand that they are um, valid cultural expressions of humanity's encounter with the divine. And we we let doctrines get in the way. Then, um, then what ought to be one of humanity's greatest strengths, which is our spiritual diversity, becomes um, our great, one of our greatest challenges, and it becomes a, a huge barrier to acting um, in concert, you know, to, to acting coherently, which the human race needs to do right now if it's going to get through uh, and survive into whatever the next you know the, the next age of, of civilization is going to be. We have to find a way to um, to overcome these these deep divisions, um, to, to truly come to a, a full awareness of the divine within within each of us. Um, and I and I think that um, too many people look at religion as as the problem. Um, and and I think participating in panels like this just convinces me that it is in fact the solution. Wow, that was great. I wrote down two things when you said faith is strengthened by panels like this. That you just validated the whole <laughs> LOSN interfaith group. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, so we our third question for the panel is how do you lead your congregation through your faith tradition from awareness of these huge environmental and sustainability challenges to hope and then to action. And let's see, Misando, I want to start with you. Okay, uh, well, I'm fairly new to this community. So I'm, you know, often in the first year, um, you're leading, but I'm learning uh, a lot more than leading, I think, uh, from the congregation, but I know that will always be the case. Um, but, you know, I know I've been a part of a few different congregations as a minister and even more as um, as a congregant. And um, what I know is um, there is often a fear um, of upsetting folks when it comes to issues of justice or when it comes to issues that are already being politicized and polarized out there in the world we're all living in. And there, I, I want to acknowledge how difficult it can be to be holding that balance between, you know, preaching and um, leading from a place that is rooted in our values as a church in a community and rooted in our theological foundations, like we've been talking about tonight but also being willing to apply those to the real issues of our world. Um, I have seen churches that have hesitated and not said anything and played it safe. Um, 
and I have seen churches like ours that have been unapologetic, uh, have spoken from a place that is rooted in theology and rooted in values, has lost people because of that, uh, but has, has also gained people along the way. I don't think there's an easy answer for how we do this as communities, especially given the ways in which the polarization of our society is happening. Um, so kind of starkly right now. Um, but what I do know is that when, um, when we take issues that are really impacting people uh, and species uh, in, and all sentient beings, and we root that in a faith that is resonant with people. Uh, and then we then give them avenues uh, to then take action. That that's what keeps people's faith continuing to grow and continuing to stay new and alive. And so I think for us, we just are kind of have this, at least here at NTCSL, we're like, we're unapologetic about what we, what we stand for. <laughs> we're always going to root it in love and that everything that's happening in the world is either an expression of love or a call for more love. And then we're going to invite people into tangible ways to take action, to live out those values, to put uh, uh, our faith uh, into our feet, uh, whether that's participating in a march or getting involved in organizations like this. So that's always growing and evolving, but it takes kind of some buy-in from, from leadership to have a strategy and, and to knowing how to do it. And it's, I just wanna say, it's not easy. It's never an easy answer. You know, the politics of church are just as real as politics of our country. Um, but, it, you know, when it's rooted in vision uh, and hope and love, uh, I think it can, ultimately you're, you're, going, you're going to reach the people that you're meant to reach. Uh, and, and you're going to fulfill the mission of, of your church uh, in a way that you couldn't if you were playing it safe. So that's just my personal position. I'm sure there are many other ministers that would have different ones, but that's kind of how we are going about it here at NTCSL. Yeah, it, it's a challenge, not just in the religious community, but just in uh, the community at large is how do you motivate people to take action and how do you, how do you make, it, uh, make it real? Um, Christy, do you wanna, Give us your perspective. Yes, thank you. And thank you, each of you, Stephen and Jenny and Brad and Masando. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. So how do you lead your con congregation through your faith tradition from awareness to hope to action? Um, I think leading by example is always a good place to start. Um, my role in, um, in my church right now is on the communication and council council and it involves working with members of the community in and out of our faith on projects that benefit the community and the environment. Um, earlier this month we teamed up with uh, free bikes for kids. We collected over a thousand bikes that will be refurbished and offered for free uh, to children throughout the Portland area. Um, my committee members gather information on uh, local service opportunities like that and post them on a website called Just Serve. And this week, um, for example, advertised projects include removing English ivy from natural areas around Fano Creek Trail. Um, and with, uh, if you know, Tualatin River Keepers and Tualatin Parks and Recs are all, are both working with that. Um, another one is a work party for Friends of the Tualatin River Wildlife Refuge. Um, and earlier today, um, a downtown Portland cleanup with SALF. So those are the kinds of things that um, we post on Just Serve. And if you have ideas, if you have projects, uh, we would love to post those as well and um, and just see if that we can get more visibility for more people to uh, be able to see a menu of, of ways they can make a difference and take action. Um, the church as a 
as a whole, uh, because we do have a really centralized leadership uh, structure, um, they have uh, a, a sense of responsibility, of course, and they've created, created sustainable design for uh, our buildings throughout the world. Um, there's uh, thousands of acres of farmland that we use to raise food for the hungry and um, and and feeding the hungry is a big part of what my committee does as well. Um, so responsible agriculture is uh, a big part of what we do with those uh, ranches and farms. Also significant recycling efforts um, over like about 50 of different uh, Deseret Industries thrift stores run by the church. Um, 66 million pounds is the most recent number that I could uh, come up with annually uh, for recycling things that would otherwise go into landfills. Uh, so these are some of the ways that we uh, are trying to live what we believe, invite people to participate with us, to make a difference um, and to take action. That's great. I, I love sort of the yin and yang of Masando and Christy is yours. That was so tactical, tactic, you know, practical. And, and, and uh, so that was, that was really great. Jenny, can you share with us your thoughts? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think as a, as a leader in this community, of course, I try to um, preach on these topics. And I try to, as you said, Christy, lead by example and, and um, embody many of the practices that we, we talk about, basically walk, walk the walk. But to be honest, I think the, the best thing that I do um, is really learn from and give space to and um, celebrate and uh, cheerlead the, the lay leaders in my congregation. And I think in, in this group also who for whom um, environmental justice is the way that they connect most deeply with their spirit and and with God. And I think I, I uh, was asking some of the members of my church, you know, what just about the history of our of our of our activism here, some of which I know, but uh, one of our team leaders was like, well, you know, our green team's been around since the 90s and, you know, the early 90s. And I'm like, I'm in high school at that time, you know, and this is these are folks that have been just doing this stuff for so long. and. I feel like I, I, Cheryl read it in my introduction, but I feel like in the 12 years that I've been here, I've just learned so much from the congregation in terms of those those practical concrete ways of having bioswales and rain gardens and, um, and uh, just all kinds of, you know, recycling efforts and green cleaning products. And uh, right now we have a community carbon plot out front where we're testing the carbon levels of our soil and just, the, the different things, uh, I mentioned also we were fighting the black, I'm fighting the black plastic in my own yard. We have it all over our church property and we're pulling that up. And, you know, so I think there's just, there's, I think giving people and letting people share those concrete actions that they're doing um, inspires all of us to make a difference. And I think that, I mean, one of the things that I feel like happens in my church is we all are working so hard and it, and it often feels overwhelming. It feels like, you know, we're, it's a drop in the bucket for what the world needs. But I think just being there to remind us and to celebrate when we do this work together and when we, when we all are doing it, it just helps, it makes a difference and it does have an impact. And we, we can nurture each other and support each other in that. And I think, you know, in the United Church of Christ, our denomination, like you were talking about yours, Christy, our denomination as a whole has a long history of working uh, for environmental justice. It does a lot of national work, advocacy, policy work, and there's a lot of things to be able to tap into. And I think just, again, giving folks those resources um, to, know what to, to know what to do. And, and I think as a, you know, as a pastor and as a minister, I often feel like we have a saying in the United Church of Christ, I say it every week, is we're, you know, wherever you are in your journey, you're welcome here. And I feel like part of my job is to meet people wherever they are in their journey and help move us one step forward. So for some, that's maybe going to be moved to recycling. For some, it's moved to an electric car. For some, it's moved to advocacy. But also for some, it's they're already doing all that and they're tired. And so it's giving, giving hope and reminding them that 
let's keep doing this or remember our faith empowers us to do this and um just just remembering that again we're not alone god god is with us the spirit is with us we are with each other and together we really can make a difference so i think that's probably that that role for me as well i really like that giving people space and meeting them sort of where they are and giving them an opportunity to to take the the next step that that they need to so brad what would you like to add to this rich conversation First of all, I am a Christian because it is a bloody theology. It is not, it, it is a bloody theology. And so my spiritual practice every morning is to spend time in meditation, looking at the corpus of Jesus, a crucifix on a coffee table, and to contemplate that that is, in my understanding, the, the reality the only the point of intersection of God and the world that this is what happened as a result of overconsumption of of pride of control of all of those things that are endangering our existence now and that all I have to do in any given day above any expectation is to be able to to emulate that action to lay my life down so I, I'm much more systemic in my interest around, around sustainability, because I think that every issue of sustainability comes from that, that very reality that we are not, we're not complete, we're not healed, and we overconsume. we, we own more property than we can live in, we have more possessions than we even know we have. And so I encourage my community to focus on unresolved grief, because I think that that is what is at the heart of all of this. We are a grieving society, a grieving world. We have not dealt with the losses that we've, we've had. And so it has created the need to band-aid that and to move into new existence with more stuff and more things and it's destroying our world. We need so little to survive. And, and I've come to experience that I need so little to, to feel secure. All I need is a space that I can be, and it doesn't require very much, very much there. So um, I think that unresolved grief is the reality that we face on every level of our faith life, and it is destroying it the creation because we we cannot resolve that creation seems to <laughs> despite the grief that we place on top of it it seems to come back over and over but we we can't we we just keep putting more artificial things in in place so that's that thank you for that this uh you know this sort of the sobering the sobering piece that that we need to, to face full so, front. So I'm so sorry. So Steve, no. If, if I can um, just, one more thing. So in terms of sure. my congregation, I really encourage them to have a practice around Sabbath to be able to hold a day or to hold a practice that is without expectation, that's without demand, that's absolutely resting. That, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Stephen. Well, there are no clergy in the Baha'i faith, so I'm not, uh, I can't speak from the perspective of, of leadership within the community. Um, the the Baha'is in, 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 in a way are, are a bunch of, uh, of unhurtable cats. You know, each, each of us has our own, our own uh, path that we're following. Um, although there is certainly a degree of, of, of global coordination at the, at the worldwide level, there are a few million Baha'is um, very scattered throughout the world, um, more focused really in the developing uh, and developing uh, developing world uh, than in places like like the United States. But despite the the, the smallest of its of its numbers, um, you know, the if it is to to act as a leaven to to, to catalyze a, a movement, uh, then the then the the size of it isn't isn't going to be the the main consideration. Um, the tiniest you know speck of uh, of, of the mustard seed will, will be enough. 
Um, so what, what Baha'is do then really on a local level, understanding that the transformation of society begins at the, at the neighborhood level um, is we try to figure out how to create spiritualized uh, communities at the neighborhood level. Uh, what does this include? This includes having some place to come together in prayer. It means having some venue for the moral education of children uh, and youth. Uh, it means having a, a, a space for, um, for conversation about deep topics um, and uh, having meaningful conversations on, on the basis of, um, uh, on the basis of, of, of the different scriptures of the different world religions. Um, the Baha'i community in the United States in particular uh, has been particularly active in, uh, in issues of, of racial justice, really from the beginning of the, of the 20th century um, and, and continuing into the present day. Uh, the local Lake Oswego Baha'i community, um, as small as it is, just a, a couple of dozen people, uh, is very active, for example, in, in responding to racism uh, in, in Lake Oswego. So we devote our, our, our sort of limited numerical resources towards, um, towards trying to, um, to create the nuclei of spiritual communities uh, and focusing as, as much as we can on, on this most challenging issue for the United States, which is that of, of racial, racial justice. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you panelists for, for your responses to all those those questions that, that we, we put together for you. Um, I'd like to open it up to, to all of you here that have come and you can raise your hand, um, put a question in chat that we can read. We have, you know, 10 minutes or so. So we'll be able to take a few questions. Anybody have some, um, something they would like to ask our panelists? Everyone is contemplating all those things that you, you talked about. I have to say, I, I don't like really using this analogy, but it's sort of like drinking from a fire hose, hearing all those different perspectives about those really, really um, meaty topics. So, um, yeah, Trina, how are things in Hawaii? <laughs> no, 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 Cheryl. We are going to go <laughs> Um, well, we heard, we heard a little bit of this in the introductions, but if bearing, uh, from, from, uh, what, what Cheryl read, but how about this, um, on a personal level, what makes care for the earth meaningful to you on a personal level? And is there someone who wants to start instead of me calling on one of you? Well, I think Trina, because in Hawaii, you know, the, the volcanoes and the, you know, the climate change, that's, that's pretty major out there, right? I mean. Yeah, you know, and there's a big um, sort of a, like a little a war going on between the indigenous population of Hawaii and um, some special interest groups who are doing something that you might think as a person who isn't from here are really for the greater good. These gigantic uh, telescopes on some very large mountains were placed there by various companies, including a big university and the Canadian company, and they're trying to build a, a, an even larger telescope. These aren't these aren't these are telescopes that are several several acres large. They're very big, and they are planted on a sacred site for the people of Hawaii. So there are lots of protests, and um, you can see though that there isn't a lot of awareness of this. It sounds scientific. It's research based. They do a lot of good, and it's a, a curiosity. But then there's a group of people who are indigenous, who are very involved with protesting the placement of these telescopes. And a yeah. lot of them are women. Mm. It's, it's really interesting. 
Well, that's, that's, I, I guess I had meant this question to be addressed to the panelists, but thank you for that. That was, that's a very, that was a great perspective to, to hear because that, you know, that we had those kinds of things going on yeah. all over. Um, any of our panelists, maybe, um, you're all so shy. I can't believe it. Okay, Richard, do you have a question for them? You need to unmute yourself if you're going to ask a question. Richard, we can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. I don't know if I can do that. Let me see if I can do that. Well, okay. Sometimes I, 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 you can hold down the space of bar and speak. Let's see, that didn't work. I was just gonna, I, I'm happy to answer the question. Oh, there we go. Okay, Richard, go, for, go, okay. go ahead. Well, I've been listening, and then there's a lot of talk about spiritual growth in that. But uh, you know, I'm I'm facing 91 here in a few days, and I've been around for quite a while, and I I've, I've followed this uh, sustainability and this climate crisis. Uh, I've got a physics background basically, and I. Uh, I listen to people like uh, Guy McPherson, who's uh, probably one of the most eminent uh, psych, uh, weather uh, climate scientists in the world. And uh, he says it's virtually all over. You know, it, 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 there isn't radical change, radical change within the next two, a couple, three years that, that we're, we're finished as a civilization. I, I kind of believe him, and I don't see any sense of rage and and really wanting to get in there with all fours. I'm I'm creating a website now about uh, global warming and that, trying to hook a few folks up. But uh, I don't know what uh, I don't see the sense of rage. I th I think everybody wants to come together and be nice and cozy with each other, but. But I, we we've got to get out there. We're we're facing a we're facing an exponential curve that is uh, that is astounding and it's frightening to me. Hmm. Well, thank you for for sharing that, um, Masando. Do you want to? I mean that that's sort of like I felt like you talked a little bit about that balance between fear and polarization and and action. Yeah, no, I appreciate what you said, Richard, uh, because with the climate crisis and to me with all issues of justice, there has to be some sense of urgency um, for anything to happen. Uh, so, you know, I think for us, we are really being led by our Earth Action Team, who has also been around for a, for a long time uh, doing this work. Um, and I think we can create that urgency, that sense of urgency, you know, through the ways in which we talk about, you know, the, the issues that are important to us. Um, but I think also our job is to, <laughs> like, is to inspire hope, you know, is to invite people to come together, is to live out their faith, um, through the actions we are being inspired to take um, and hopefully just, you know, really encourage people to connect with the issue deeply enough to where that sense of urgency begins to build within them uh, as something that's natural, as something that is life-giving, as something that requires other people to be a part of in order to sustain. Uh, I love that there's a practice of 
of Jenny, you talked about like supporting those who have been doing this work for a long time. Uh, because as we know, like any movement requires that it sustains itself sometimes for generations um, in order for any change to happen. I appreciate your fire, Richard. And, um, and I think often that is called for. And often that sense of urgency arises you know, when we responded to the refugee refugees from Afghanistan after the Taliban took over, when we responded to what was happening in Ukraine and, you know, sending direct some, some money through our tithing directly to some families that were seeking to get out. You know, we, our congregation acts very quickly in ways that are small, um, but this climate crisis is, is big, you're right because it requires all of us. So I don't have an easy answer for that. Um, but I appreciate your invitation to bring more fire uh, to our message uh, when it comes to this issue. So I don't know if I have more to say about yeah. it. Does, do any of the other panelists have a, some, a few thoughts that they'd like to add to that? I'd like to ask Stephen because he's a scientist, I mean, what his thoughts are on the looming crisis. <laughs> well, not, not a climate scientist, um, but um, I think um, definitely the urgency of this is going to be felt by this generation. Um, and it may take, you know, a, a heat wave in, in India or something that actually leads to widespread deaths of people before we wake up and realize that, um, that climate change is real and that we're on a we're on a collision course with with our own extinction. Um, the the problem, of course, is how do you how do you change um, how do you change the the beliefs of a of a of a whole civilization? You know, how do you shift the the viewpoint of of literally billions of people on the planet who are naturally in a state of um, of concern? For that which is closest to them, their own family, their own tribe, race, nation, religion, so forth. You know, what is going to catalyze this outward turn that that has to happen if we're going to make it? Um, I think I don't I don't think a mere philosophy is going to do it. I don't think you know a, a well placed tweet you know by the right celebrity is going to do it. It it's going to require a spiritual revelation, a revolution, a spiritual revelation. Um, it will require a, a, um, a, and and that's where you can't plan this out. You know how how did Christianity spread? You know, like lightning through the you know through the Roman Empire in in the first centuries. You know how did how did Islam spread across you know so much of the civilized world in the course of just a few generations? Um, it's the power of the power of, of ideas and the is and particularly the power of 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 spiritual ideas um, is something which we can't sort of calculate and we can't engineer it. Um, it's something that has to proceed spontaneously from from the hearts, um, but and then it spreads from heart to heart and then it takes off like wildfire. So I, I think that's what the world needs. You know, it, saying that it's one thing, but you know, well, what is it then? You know, where is that spark to be found? Uh, who is delivering it? Uh, what is the nature of uh, you know wh what is the nature of of the message? Um, I, I think it has ultimately will have something to do with this dawning awareness of the deep interconnectedness of us with each other and with and with the world, uh, and an understanding of the essential sacredness of our uh, of every human soul uh, and also of every atom of existence that everything in a way is shining with the with the divine light um, according to its own capacity and, and potentiality you know from, from from people all the way down to atoms everything is reflecting and refracting the light of divine love uh, and that's one of the deep intuitions of, of all the great mystical traditions of, of the East and the West um, in, in, in all the spiritual paths that, that humanity has, has tread. How does, but that mystical path has always only been tread by a few people. It seems to almost naturally be the province of very few who really 
uh, catch that that spark uh, and are are lit aflame by this idea of the of the oneness underlying everything and the essential sacredness of all things. Um, so saying that is is not I guess not a solution, but it's it's I think where I think the direction where, where the solution lies. Well, thank you, thank you, Stephen. You know, I'm. I, oh, Jenny, do you want to? Did you want to add? Well, I just, just was going to add. If there's a minute, I was just going to add something to what Stephen said. We're past a minute, but go add a minute anyway. Okay. Well, I was just going to say I really appreciate that because I think it ties into something um, Brad was talking about earlier, which is, I feel like the the closest or the most recent I've seen that sense of collective consciousness is actually at the very start of the pandemic when everything when the world did come together to, to, to shut down, slow down and, um, and actually work for the good of each other. Like the companies stopped traveling, the, you know, everything. And, and it was incredibly hard, but, but what we saw was like, I mean, when the people were dancing in the streets and, you know, or, or, you know, in their balconies and cheering on the medical workers and, and when creation was allowed to flourish again and, the animals could come back where they where they couldn't cross the street before because they'd get hit by a bus. And there was a simplification of our lives in that time um, that I think you were alluding to, Brad, that like we can't just go back to the way things were. We have to we have to transform and evolve. And the problem, which I hear you saying, Stephen, is what prompted that was a worldwide pandemic where people came face to face with their own mortality. And I think you're right. I mean, we are. I mean, I'll speak for myself, but I'm guessing many of us, we are insulated by a lot of our privilege and that we don't, we're not day to day facing, um, facing the, the, either the economic or for those of us who are, who are white, the racial, um, the injustices that, that many people in our country face or many people in other parts of the globe face. And so it, it's sad, but I think you're right, Stephen, in some ways, like it's going to take and it may not even be a heat wave in India, honestly. It's going to have to be a heat wave right here where we ourselves are affected to get that real sense of urgency in some way. And I think how, and, and it's a difference between trying to manu, I mean, you don't want to manufacture, I mean, you don't want to, I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know how to, well, let me just say, Stephen, I love your idea of like the vision of having like the ideas and the vision be the prompting. Um, and if we can do that, it, we have capacity, just like you're saying, Masanda, there's great potential, great possibility. Even tonight, I feel so much more hope after seeing that the collective energy and ideas. Um, but yeah, how we do that and how we really get, get that urgency that you're talking about, Richard, um, that's, that is what we well, need. The point that I'm trying to make, that I'm making this website that I'm developing is that it, we can't wait for a calamity to, to start turning us on. Uh, we've got to we've got to realize as educated people that something really is wrong. If we wait for a calamity, it may be too late. You know, we're 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 we'll be ruining the end of civilization. Yeah, and I think it may, it I may think come in, a, I, in another two or three years. It, you know, we've got to do something. You're right. I think this is a great way to, um, you know, I, I guess we all have our, our ways of, I think that we've all said that it's, um, for me, it's what can I do? I'm sitting here, what can I do personally? And I, I guess I feel like, I think Jenny, you said it, is that seeing this collective um, of people that are, are wanting to work on things, and, and then, so what do you do? You know, is it what Christy said, like some of the, the, the very practical things that they've done and the, the, the sustainability certification that the United Church of Christ has gotten is, you know, is that going to solve it? Maybe, maybe not, but sitting in, you know, my balance is, am I gonna sit in gloom and, and be depressed about it? Or am I going to, Get that repair fair going or something and, and and how am i going to get that collective hope so i guess richard we won't be able to answer your question entirely today but you know what i would love you to do is send us your your website and we'll include that in our follow-up to this and and have that as another resource on our on our web page and i'm seeing i'm i, I do want to 
be respectful of people's time. Um, it's it's past eight thirty. This has been this has been really different for our interfaith group, and I I love it. I, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate the attendance. I really um, want to thank again all the panelists for for coming and sharing your your thoughts and your insight with us. There's there uh, you know I, I can we have recorded this and we'll be posting the recording as well and let you know where that is so you can pass it on to to other people and and Richard I hope that your 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 message will come across loud and clear as well so um, I'd like to just say thank you again to everybody thank you for attending thank you for to our panelists and um, good night and we'll be we'll be in touch so I'm go in peace yes thank you good <laughs>